Hello, 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 everybody here is Dr. Wild again talking about different topics and science. Remember guys that we create and design this podcast to let everybody know about Harvard University and the magazine of Harvard Medical School. You can also visit our official website which is magazine.hmr.harvard.edu. You will be able to browse thousands of thousands of articles by issue or by topic. You will be asking Dr. Wild which topics do we have? Research, community, education, care delivery, hours, and achievement. The article to review today is a radical turn. A physician recalls the fight to achieve equitable medical care for a black community in one small town in Louisiana. A garden party in Washington, D.C. was not a venue. I would have, though, would be a becoming radicalistic and deeply involved in a small group of sunster black men and women seeking their cyber stride. Yet, It was the first step on a road to precise that. In the summer of 1965, the MCHR wished to identify and rectify health dispersed in the state of Louisiana. I volunteered to help with this by March of that year. I had procured travel orders from a somewhat heritage director at the NIH, where I was a public service health officer doing research. I was approved to go to Bogalusa, a small town in northern Louisiana, to get near the border with Mississippi to supervise hospitals and available race related statistics, conduct interviews, and produce a sort of report would help the MCHR prepare for the disappointment I was planning in Louisiana for later that year. In my third year at Harvard Medical School, I had taken public health course in which I surveyed Trenton, New Jersey. I evaluate health delivery resource provided by the private sector, the city, the state, and the federal government. I also analyzed public health statistics and racial disorder, visit hospitals and clinics, and interviewed doctors, nurses, health administrators, and patients. My supervisor at Harvard Medical School talks that he is a cardiologist an epidemiologist at Massachusetts General Hospital and a founder of the MCHR had approved my report and even suggested that I consider going into public health. To prepare to my work in Louisiana, I review health statistics for the state while also reading disturbing news of civil rights protests and their violent suppression in Bogalusa and elsewhere in the South. Nevertheless, I remain commitment to my decision to go. Rare based attraction in the region were many. In 1964, three young civil rights workers had been killed by the Ku Klux Klan in Philadelphia, Mississippi, about 100 150 miles northeast of Bogalusa. In February 1965, a civil rights organizer from the Congress of Racial Equality was severely beaten in Bogalusa by the Klan. One month later, the Selma, Alabama black and white protesters were beaten by police during a non-violent march. One person was killed and many were injured, including John Lewis and young black activists and later a member of the United States House of Representatives. Voters registration efforts in Bogalusa were put in court and the Bogalusa Civic and Borders League, organized by members of the black community, announced that volunteers would be coming to the city and that, in early April, the court director, James Farmer, would lead a protest march targeting cigarette lunch counters and other facilities. The black community in Bogalusa mobilized in early 1965 in Fort the Deacons for Defense and Justice, an armed defense group dedicated to protecting the community and civil rights demonstrators 
members from the clan and the police, many of whom were themselves members of the clan. This was the environment I entered on the evening of March 13, 1965, when I landed at the New Orleans airport. As the plane touched down, I would almost hear the warning of the NIH director. Whatever you do, Stanley, do not get involved in any civil rights and disturbance. And do, do not mention that you are from the NIH or are a PHS officer that would get us a travel. I have really, and it turned out, Navili agreed. I was met at my baggage claim by Joel Ristin, who introduced himself as a Bogalusa court representative. We climbed into his car and headed not north to the Bogalusa, but such toward court headquarters and Ryder Street in the black water of New Orleans. There, I reviewed my plan for my next few days in Bogalusa with a sounder director of court. With this help, I identified people that I should meet and place I intend to serve. I especially want to visit the Washington Street Taman Charity Hospital, an institution built in 1951 with Federal Hill Burton funds and cited to the Title VI desegregation requirements in the recently passed Voting Rights Act. When I finished discussing my plans, Joel told me that while in Bogalusa, I would be the guest of the Hikes family. Joel and I were headed north for Bogalusa by 10 p.m. Before putting the car in gear, Joel removed a black oil report from his bright case and placed it between our seats. What the hell are we going with a gun? I asked him. Well, he said, as long as it's not consulate, it's legal in Louisiana. There is a clan out there. We drove along the causeway, a 23-mile-long concrete highway above Lake Ponchard Train. As its a sign announced, Mandolin, the causeway diverts into the narrow, soggy road. After about 30 minutes out, the car quickly entered a badly lit agglomeration of houses. This was Bogalusa. We crossed a bridge to reach the home of Robert and Valeria Hicks. Nervous black men carrying those guns surround me as I step out of the court. I became aware of the sulfuric extension in the air, the unfully efficient from the distant remains of the crown celery paper mill. I was greeted of the open door by Jackie, a slight woman who grave with my butter vials and took me into the darkness room where her husband was standing. She told me not to walk in front of the window and to keep the light steaming in the house at night to avoid being a target. A shotgun leaned against a wall. Jackie offered me a sandwich and a glass of milk and we thought of plans for the next few days. Bob told me that he has just elected vice president of the league and that I would soon meet H.Z. John, the league's new president and owner of a small fleet of taxi cabs that serve the black community. Both men work at the paper mill and belongs to its long establishment Black Union. Later, Jackie showed me to what was evidently a young boy's room where I would spend the night. Her sons were and Rock were staying with A.Z. In the morning, an armed man a deacon drove me to stay Matthew's Episcopal Church to meet with a pastor. I reviewed with him the names of people I planned to interview in a white community. He identified some who would like to sympathize and some who would 
got. He gave me his phone number in case of an emergency. I went ahead with my business that day, walking to the various office where I had made appointments, and at the end of the day, I called one as the AZ taxis so that I could return to the highest for dinner. After dinner, a deacon came by and took me back into my town for the appointment with the director of the community medical center. I'm very willing to continue segregation. The director told me if I were not forced to bear total responsibility for doing it. The following day, I was driving to my appointment with the superintendent at the charity hospital. He seemed complex when I introduced myself, showed him the PHS identified card, and asked permission to share an hours and waiting rooms. I told him I was the Dirmi Charities Compliance and with the title B1. He angrily questioned my credentials, then called the guard to escort me out the hospital. I have been in Bogalusa for five days, visiting, gathering information and documents, and taking photographs when I told everyone that I have finished my surf and want to leave soon. A few members of the deacons, including Bob and AZ, invited me to have a parting beer with the them of the Blue Room Tavern in a black center of the town. It was April 4th. I was happy to accept. We had become comfortable and each other, and I had become entirely conserve and their cause. I was sipping my second beer when I blew lights of the squared car came through the open door. Two policemen entered the bar, one ordered me to stand up, marched me out the door and fridged me under the fluorescent flare of the bar sign. He pushed me into the back of the squared car with Dolores, who had served me and were taking the station. At the booking desk of my officer clerks and a small say, Dolores Dolores serve you a board that is only for blah blah. You are arrested at the material weakness against a her. I turned out of the when Dolores served me a white man. Me appeared she had a violet city and a state ordinance of prohibit individuals of different races from drinking alcohol together so they couldn't be drinking black people with white people. That's all the trouble of this sentence. Maybe you want a lawyer. The detective in the police station said before tossing me as city directory and hanging me to the telephone. I call lawyer listed in the directory to explain my plights. No good help. An officer pushed me into the holding cell with held three black three white men and smell of the unit and alcoholic sea. At about 2 a.m., a policeman opened the cell and said, You can leave, someone pay you a bail. As I walk out of this station and into the town square, I notice two dark segments with Mississippi license plates filled with the white men plus glowing cigarettes. I had an idea who those men might be, the clan, so I stepped back into the station and told the officer that I need to call a taxi. I call a bob and within 10 minutes three car filled with the armed deacons arrive to the pick me up. Our car rushes through the only street followed by the sedan shot were fired. The deacon who was in the back seat with me pushed it to my floor. Jackie was out of town that evening, so I was driving to the home of another black family with ties of the deacons. There I learned why I have been released. After my arrest, one of my drinking partners, he called the white owner of the Blue Room Tavern and told him to bail me out, otherwise the deacons could burn down the bar. What the hell are we doing with a gun? I asked him, well, he said, as long as no conceal is the legal of Louisiana there was the clan out there so that's why they have like to introduce to all that situation for the united states make these big changes between the white and the black people isn't it 
crazy all this story guys who are listening to me in this moment oh my gosh this is a beautiful article that everybody should read today in Bogalusa the highest house is which I stay is listed for significance of the national register of historic places and is slated to become a civil rights museum historical documents from that time are being assembled on a digital collection for the museum photograph that I took while in Bogalusa my associate documents and my medical reports and relief response from court and the MCHR will be part of the museum exhibition and available now on the Louisiana Digital Library website and on the board of directors of the Plain Museum. Alright guys, we have finished the review of this article today, which is a radical turn. Remember guys, you can browse it at the Harvard Medical School magazine, which is magazine.hmet or harvard.edu. You will be able to browse thousands of thousands of articles like this beautiful article who tell us how was that big history in the United States before when black people have to do so many changes with the white people to have the same civil rights. All right, guys, this is Dr. Wild in one episode of this year, this beautiful podcast, Dr. Wild Podcast. Remember, you can download all these episodes, beautiful to introduce Dr. Wild with the Harvard University around the world, meeting, letting people to introduce to our beautiful articles who are posted in our official website. All right, see you next time. Bye-bye.